So yeah, I probably get more questions about animals than almost any other thing. Uh, almost every gardener at some time is going to encounter some kind of animals in their garden. Um, and of course, animals are wildlife, which means they are wild. So they often just do things that we don't want them to do and not things that we don't expect them to do. So it's just not an exact science, but we're going to talk today about how to uh, help deal with them. Um, first, a little bit of general background, and then we'll talk about different methods for controlling them. And then the last part of the presentation will be about the most common ones, the ones that you're most likely to see in your garden at some time or another. Um, just to differentiate a little bit, insects um, technically are animals, but today we are not talking about insects. We're talking about what we call large animals, and large is a relative term, so anything that's larger than an insect um, is what we'll be talking about. So all the way from small little mice, all the way up to big deer. So those are what we're talking about, large animals. And of course, a big factor will be your garden location. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this specifically, but especially in relating to deer and some of the other animals, if you're near wooded areas, you're much more likely to encounter some of those animals than if you are totally surrounded by suburbs. Although sometimes animals will surprise you and they'll show up in locations where you wouldn't expect them. The other thing just to be aware of is that different types of animals cause different types of damage. And um, you know, sometimes you may not have seen the damage, not be familiar with it, and you'll say, what caused that? I can't tell because you don't see the animal. Uh, but if you're familiar with what kinds of damage occurs, then you'll know what kind of animal you might be dealing with. For instance, the, in the picture right here at the right is an ear corn, which has been shredded and eaten. And that is by a raccoon. And you can tell that by their little claws will just shred back the, the husk and eat up the, the corn. So anyhow. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the issue is to try to figure out what kind of animal problem you have to do a diagnosis. Because then if you do that, then you know what way to control them, what how to implement the best control methods, so how you can protect your garden. And one of the, the obvious animal control methods would be fencing. Um, and there's going to be a lot of considerations, different things to think about. And one of them is height. Definitely will depend on the animal. So something like a rabbit, you might only need a fence that's two feet tall. And if that's the only thing you're dealing with, great. Um, but if you're dealing with deer, um, then you might have an eight foot tall fence. In fact, you will need an eight foot tall fence or some other, there's other ways to do it too, but typically that's what they say for deer is eight foot tall. And then so suppose you have deer and rabbits, you might have an eight foot tall fence, but be putting a strand of chicken wire like this you'll see right here around the bottom to keep out the rabbits. So you might need to be thinking about keeping out two different kinds of animals. The other thing with fencing is, you know, it doesn't have to be permanent fencing. Um, sometimes it might be temporary. A, let's say you're gonna make your garden and maybe you're gonna move it later or maybe you're gonna expand it. So if you can do some kind of temporary fencing, usually that's cheaper, but also that just gives you flexibility to move the fencing if you decide you're gonna do something different. And of course, if you're talking about putting up a fence, a big factor will be the, what material are you going to use and how much is it going to cost. And then finally, um, you know, what does it look like? Sometimes in certain neighborhoods, uh, there might be restrictions about putting up certain fences, um, how high or what types of fencing, and even sometimes city zoning laws will affect that too. Um, you don't want to be putting up a real big ugly fence that your neighbors are not going to be happy with so think about that too as far as types of fencing there's a bunch of different kinds um i just mentioned chicken wire and that just refers to a very lightweight type wire most of you have seen that it's got little hexagonal um wire you know where it's you know areas that for, for keeping out the animals um that are all about an inch and a half in diameter um, 
chicken wire you can actually get in taller heights, but often it comes in about 24 inches tall. Um, chain link fence, everyone's familiar with that. Chain link fence is probably one of the most expensive fences um, that you can put up. Um, and it's not easy to do yourself. Typically for chain link, you would have to hire a contractor, whereas some of the other kinds of fence, you can just put them up yourselves fairly easily. Um, so galvanized wire rolls, you'll see that at the big box stores like Home Depot. Um, comes in different heights. And if you need to make it really tall, it won't come in eight feet tall height, but you can do two layers, two heights um, of four foot fencing to get your eight feet for deer. And there's different kinds of galvanized fencing, but um, typically this is what someone might think of like as farm type fencing. And then there's cattle panels. And cattle panel, if you haven't seen that, that's a rigid, heavy duty, high gauge metal fence that you put up in sections. They come in about 16 feet long um, and typically four feet high. Um, and it's just very easy to put up because you can literally just um, nail it to a wooden post using a fence staple, or you could just fasten it with a zip tie if you're using like a key post. So it's very easy to put up and take down. You can also buy Fabric rolls, kind of like what you might have seen for bird netting. They also sell a similar product for deer netting. Um, comes in different sizes and it's just a fabric and essentially you're just hanging that from a post. Um, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. I put some up once and the deer literally just ran right through it and just broke it. So it didn't matter. Didn't matter. Um, as far as types of posts, you can put up Wooden posts, like you see here in this picture, this is some galvanized metal roll fencing here. Um, but you can also use T post, which is the metal post that you pound in with a post driver. And T posts are really easy to put up. Sometimes what people do is they'll put wooden ones up on the corners and then put T posts in between and fasten the fence to that. And then there's electric fencing, which um, is very common out in rural areas for keeping things like sheep and cattle and stuff in bounds. Um, but you can also use it to keep animals out. Um, I don't know a lot about setting up electric fencing other than it's relatively easy. Um, you have to decide what height the wire will need to be for what kind of animal. For instance, like a deer, they say you wanna have it so it will kind of hit the deer just kind of in the chest. That's where they would want to do that. The other thing just to be aware of with electric fencing is it is a hazard for children. Um, it's not like a fatal thing. Often people, if you're not familiar with electric fences, will be afraid that somebody's gonna get electrocuted. You can't actually get electrocuted. It just gives you a good jolt that lets you know that this is not a good place to be. And so for the animals, it makes them want to run the other way and stay away from it. Um, so in some places, electric fencing is not allowed. Um, generally, that would be in like a, a more rural area or suburban area farther out, uh, but just to be mindful of, you know, the different cautions that go along with that. Uh, but if you need to learn more about electric fencing, I send you to the internet and there's lots of good information available there. Um, another major method of controlling animal pests would be live trapping or there's also um, non-live trapping, but um, generally I'm not a big fan of the non-live trapping, um, unless you're maybe just getting mice or rats or something like that. But, uh, you know, it's a little bit different when you're thinking about raccoons and squirrels and rabbits and things like that. Um, there is a product line called Have a Heart Traps. And basically what that is, it's a live trap. This is one right here for a raccoon. Um, it has a one side that opens up and then you uh, put some bait inside it, some kind of food that will be attractive to the animal, put it inside. And then as they walk in, they step on a little step, a lever, and that closes the gate behind them and they're trapped inside. Um, it's pretty easy to do. Um, you need to have the right size trap. Um, 
So obviously for a raccoon or a groundhog, you need this extra large size. Then there's kind of a medium size for some uh, medium sized animals like rabbits. And then there's smaller ones, I think for squirrels and chipmunks like that. So different sizes. And then of course, figuring out what kind of bait to use. Um, raccoons, for instance, like sweet corn. They like fruit, like apple. Um, apple smeared with peanut butter seems to be pretty good bait. But then there's the question of what do you do with an animal like a raccoon once you catch it? Um, and there's lots of different answers for that. Sometimes people feel like the right thing to do is they want to kill the animal because they don't want to come back. And that's a personal decision. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, and then, of course, relocating the animal is not easy. And there's also some legal restrictions on that sometimes on where you can relocate. Sometimes what people will do is uh, relocate it to some place like a large forested area that's a public place, a park or something that's far away from houses. Um, but really, it's, it's kind of a tricky situation as far as relocating. If you had some land out in the country, you could relocate. There's also some people that believe that um, relocating animals is hard on the animals. Um, I've heard both sides of that argument. Um, like Maybe they have a hard time adjusting to, to their new area. So it's definitely something you want to read about before you do it. Uh, but basically, once you have this animal in a cage, you take that out. And by tipping the cage um, a couple of turns sideways, then the, the gate pops open and the animal can run out. Because you don't want to be trying to stick your hands around there where you might get bit. They do have a nice handle on them, so you can carry it uh, without the animal trying to bite you. So. Another major method for controlling animals are repellents. And um, sometimes repellents are effective, sometimes they aren't. And even in different types, um, some brands are more effective than others. And some brands uh, will stay active longer before they get washed off. So there's just lots of things to do um, to try and figure out, do your research. This particular brand here um, called Deer Scram. Um, I've heard lots of good things about it. I've talked to people who've used it and had really good luck with it. Um, so there is that. As far as um, there's different types, there's obviously ones that you purchase. But of course, if you go to the internet, you will see lots of different home remedies for making your own deer repellent or whatever, or rabbit repellent. And so if you do that, you just got to realize that it's very experimental, uh, might work for some other people, might not work for you. So um, the other thing is lots of times things don't work at all. People put them on the internet just because they heard about it from somebody and then they try it or they don't try it, but they still put it out there. So really, if you're going to try a home remedy, a homemade repellent, you just need to, A, be careful you're not using anything toxic. Um, but just make sure that it works for you. It may or may not. One of the things I know for deer you hear about a lot is like hanging a bag of human hair that maybe you got from someone who had a haircut, went to a barber shop, whatever, uh, that that will repel animal uh, deer in particular. So I've had people tell me that works really well for them. So there are some home remedies that do work. As far as how long for this repellent last, it depends on the material. Um, usually that'll tell you on the instructions. It'll also tell you how long it lasts under rain. In general, if it's going to be a rainy period, like you know it's going to rain two or three days this week, I would wait until after that rain to put the repellent down. It would just help it last long. Again, there's going to be different repellents for different animals. And there is a certain amount of labor required because typically these are sprays and you're spraying them out, or sometimes it's granule type things. In any case, there is you know, obviously time involved in that. Um, and of course, cost. So sometimes it might be easier if it's your garden to actually just put up a fence, you know, and keep, keep the animals out. Um, if it's just maybe you have like one fruit tree over here and a couple berry bushes over here, um, rather than put a fence just around them, you might try doing some repellents to try and keep away the animals in that situation. 
Um, other animal control methods, there's, there's a whole bunch of different things that you'll hear about. And some of these fall into the, the realm of home remedies. Um, and some of them just definitely have worked. You know, I, so some people tell me if they have a really good dog uh, that's on their property that chases away any kind of animals, chases away raccoons, chases away deer, that's great. I've even heard of people with cats tell me that their cats will keep away squirrels, their cats will keep away rabbits, and that's great too. Um, but not every dog is up for that, not every cat is up for that. So um, I've heard people talk about music. This would be more like in a very rural area that, you know, if they have like sweet corn that's coming into production, they don't want the raccoons to get it, or leave out an electric radio that's plugged in and playing loud music. Obviously, you would not want to do that if there were neighbors nearby. Um, but there's also um, some people that will do things um, with motion detectors. And you can set up motion detectors to either turn on lights or turn on sprinklers. Um, so let's say you have a big garden. And at night, which is often when raccoons or um, deer might be coming, is as soon as they enter the area of the zone of the garden, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of lights come on that can deter animals um, or sprinklers. Like if you have a sprinkling system, it all of a sudden start sprinkling them and shooting out water that could frighten away the animals also. So those things have worked. Um, there's also flooding. Um, for instance, this works sometimes with animals that dig a burrow or tunnels. You can flood that tunnel or burrow and that will uh, make them realize this is not a good place to live and they will go find another place. Um, and then of course hunting, uh, this again, this would be more in rural areas. Sometimes people just hunt animals. Um, you know, if you're a deer hunter and deer are getting into your garden and you're out in the country, it makes perfect sense. Um, but in any case, that's not for everyone and you can't do that in many areas, obviously. All right, so let's talk about common animal pests. These are kind of the main ones you're likely to see. Um, there's some other things, uh, as I was looking on buying some different resources and things like that. There's some things that we don't deal with too much here in Kansas City, at least at this point, like armadillos, um, elk, moose, things like that. Um, so, these are mostly things that you would find around here in our area. Um, so squirrels, rabbits, deer, chipmunks, ground squirrels, raccoons, moles, groundhogs, groundhogs, mice, rats, voles, birds, slugs, snakes, and we're gonna talk about dogs and cats being pests also. So rabbits. Rabbits actually get a lot of blame for most of the problems when something gets eaten in your garden. People often assume it's a rabbit, and sometimes you're right. Uh, they're relatively easy to control, um, they're, so they're not always the culprit. Sometimes it's other things that are doing the eating. Like, for instance, we had some sweet potato plants in our children's garden that were being eaten, and you know. You might think, oh, that's a rabbit, but actually we saw what it was at some point, and it was a groundhog. So, um, but it was, you know, chomping on those sweet potato plants just like a rabbit might. The other thing is rabbits don't always like everything that you think. Um, you know, common urban folklore or like cartoons and things like that, you think of rabbits as eating lettuce. Typically, they don't eat lettuce. They don't really like lettuce that much. Um, it's just something they like. They love, uh, favorite foods would be like green beans, young green beans, um, sweet potatoes, things like that, um, other plants, but uh, not a big fan of lettuces because they typically don't eat things like tomatoes, etc. So but as far as control, um, fencing is probably one of the easiest. Um, and the thing is for fencing, you have to have small enough um, space between the wires so that the rabbits can't get through. And so that's why chicken wire works really well. For rabbits, you just need like 24 inches tall because they don't actually just jump, leap and jump over things. Um, they can 
sort of burrow underneath fences. So they usually recommend if you're doing like chicken wire type fencing to kind of bury it about 24, uh, two inches below um, the soil line. And then the rest of the fence would stick up above the soil line. And that'll stop them from, you know, trying to squeeze underneath. But also, um, you know, if you're using some other kind of fencing, um, like the, the welded wire fencing that you might get at Home Depot, the spacing on that is like two inches by four inches. And baby rabbits can definitely get through that. Um, even young rabbits sometimes can get through pretty small spaces, but full grown rabbits would not. So there's definitely a difference between baby rabbits and, and full grown rabbits as far as the spacing. Um, repellents, there are some good rabbit repellents. Um, that deer scram, rabbit scram product that I mentioned worked well. The other product that works fairly well and I've actually used personally in the past is a organic fertilizer that's made from dried blood. It's called blood meal. Sounds a little, little um, gross, but it's really not. It's just a dry powder. Um, when it gets wet, it does smell bad, like many things. Um, but if you put down the, the blood meal, it's actually a nitrogen fertilizer, organic fertilizer. So it's good for, for plants in that sense. But if you sprinkle it around plants that dry blood will keep rabbits away. And it can take getting wet. Um, if you have really heavy, heavy rains, it might get washed away and then you might have to reapply. But it does seem to work fairly well. Um, but there's all kinds of rabbit repellents out there. And then trapping, um, you know, you can do the have a heart live traps and try to make them if you want to do that also. Deer are a big problem for many gardeners, um, especially this is one where location is a big factor. If you're near any kinds of woods at all, um, there's a really good chance you're going to have deer. So often in the suburbs, there's lots of places where there's wooded areas nearby. Even in the, the city, the heart of the urban core in Kansas City, there's big parks like Swope Park, and there's some miscellaneous wooded areas around the city. And so sometimes deer just show up in really in unexpected places and it's kind of a surprise. Um, but you know, generally, if you have seen deer around, then you know that they're around, so you're expecting this. Uh, at my house, we, my house backs right up to some woods. There's a creek back there. And so all the things that a deer would want. So I have always had deer in my backyard and had to put up deer fence. Um, the other thing is just there is an increased deer population. I remember when I moved to Kansas City in 1967, it was seemed kind of rare to see deer around the city, but now um, I see them all the time. Um, in Grandview, where I live, I see all kinds of deer at night um, coming home, so they're just everywhere. There's different kinds of fencing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and of course, the repellents that I mentioned, and the, the limitations are that they do eventually wear off and um, you do have to apply them and you can't put them everywhere. So um, kind of a lot of work. Um, the thing just to know about deer is just some of them, the way that they, they operate. One is that they browse, which means they just like to try different things. Um, so, they, you know, munch on your trees and your shrubs, especially fruit trees. They seem to love to eat the leaves. They, they love the ends of the tips, the twigs, um, and the leaves of woody plants, but they also like soft succulent plants. Um, some of their favorite garden plants are sweet potatoes and green beans. Again, kind of like rabbits. So those just, I guess, they are very, very tasty and um, very nutritious, so deer like them. Um, the other thing is sometimes you'll read in a book about animal control for gardens, especially if you're talking about different kinds of flowers. Sometimes they'll say that this flower is deer resistant and it'll be on the list of things that deer won't eat. Well, unfortunately, sometimes deer don't get around to reading these books or these articles and they will go ahead and eat them anyhow because they might just try them and maybe they won't come back because they don't like them that much. 
but they'll try something. But they browse. And they'll try all kinds of different things, different plants, just to see what they like. And then they'll find the ones they like, and then they'll come back. The other thing is the timing on deer. You won't typically see them during the middle of the day, the heat of the day. Generally, it's in the evening, early evening, twilight time, but also early morning is the time that you might see deer. So um, if you're looking for them, that would be the time that you'd want to look for them. As far as fencing go, we talked about eight feet tall. Deer generally will not jump over an eight feet tall fence. It can be done, but it would be really unusual. Um, situation. I actually had that situation at my house um, in my garden. It turned out there were deer inside the garden because my children had left the gate open and there were deer inside. And so I chased two of them out, but one of them would not go out. And eventually, after chasing around in circles for a while, it just went and jumped up over the eight foot tall fence. But my understanding is that was because it was kind of a a survival thing. It was thought it was going to be trapped, and so it got that extra energy to jump up over the fence. But typically, just jumping into a garden, they wouldn't have the, the motivation to do that. But anyhow, strong materials are needed. Um, cattle panels are good. Welded wire fencing. Um, what some people will do is have the bottom be a more sturdy type fence, and the top will be a different type of material. If you look here in this picture. Um, the bottom picture, you can see the bottom part is what we call the cattle panel. That's this very stiff, hard metal, um, strong enough to keep cattle in place, so obviously to keep deer in place. But then above it, what we did at this garden was attach three wires. Um, and sometimes people use wires, sometimes what they'll actually use is a real heavy duty fishing line, a plastic monofilament type material. Um, and then just tie it um, at all the ends and make it tight. And then what you can do is attach um, mylar tape or mylar ribbon. Mylar is that shiny stuff that you see. Sometimes helium balloons are made out of. And um, But you can buy it in tape or ribbon. And then you fasten that onto the fence so that the deer see that. And it moves with the wind, reflected by the sunlight. And they know that there's something there, there's a barrier there, so they don't try to jump over it, they jump through it. And so that works really well. At this particular garden, they've never had deer get in, and it's, it's just worked well over the years. And is it a relatively inexpensive way to do it compared to putting a double high fence. The other option for deer would be electric fencing. Um, and again, so you need to put it at just the right height. I can't remember, I want to say it's like 36 inches, 42 inches. Um, have to look that up. And, um, you know, obviously just be aware of the problems with electric fencing. The other thing is if you put it at that height for deer, it won't keep out raccoons. So you then have to have a lower strand that would be to keep out raccoons that would hit them at the right height. So. Squirrels. Probably I get more questions on squirrels than any other animal because almost everyone has had squirrels around their neighborhood. Um, there's lots of folklore, lots of things you hear, um, lots of internet legends, things on the mythology on, on the internet that aren't necessarily true, but, um, excuse me, but squirrels can definitely be a problem. And, and the reason there's so many squirrels is because often in suburban areas, neighborhoods, um, we planted lots of oak trees, particularly years ago, pin up trees were very popular. And so it just was setting people up to have lots and lots of squirrels um, move in. Um, the other thing that squirrels particularly like, besides acorns, would be tomatoes. And that's probably the plant they bother the most and causes them the most frustration for gardeners, is squirrels eating their tomatoes. A, because they'll often take bites of that of them just as they're turning, getting ready to turn right. And often they'll take like one or two bites out of it and then just drop it and go do something else. 
Um, so it's really frustrating. You've been waiting for these wonderful tomatoes and squirrels will ruin them for you. The other problem is there's just the lack of natural predators. You know, out in the woods, there are other animals like um, coyotes and, um, and things that will, um, you know, chase squirrels, eat squirrels. Um, so you're not going to have that so much in the city. Um, if you do have a dog, that's helpful. The problem is if there's trees nearby in your garden, um, the squirrels can just jump from tree to tree without ever going on the ground. And they can just go out the end of the branch and then jump down into the garden. And um, even if there's a fence around it, obviously that won't be a problem. So there are some repellents, although the squirrel repellents I've heard are not as effective um, as like the rabbit and deer repellents, but there's probably some new stuff out there. It's definitely worth looking at on the internet, um, just knowing that you're going to probably have to try some different things. You'll hear all the time people saying, oh yeah, just mix up uh, a hot pepper spray and, and spray that on your tomatoes and that will keep the squirrels away. And I've heard some people say that works. Other people say it does not work for them. So um, trapping, uh, the live trapping works fairly well. Um, one thing that does work fairly well is um, fencing, but it's not just putting a fence around your garden. It's really more like caging, where you put a fence around your garden, uh, just maybe just around your tomatoes, and um, then have like chicken wire going over the top. I had a really good friend who, for many years, he lived over in, uh, oh gosh, Mission, Shawnee Mission area. And there were just lots of, lots of pin oak trees and lots and lots of squirrels. And he just didn't get tomatoes until he finally just built a little frame um, for his tomato patch. You know, it's about eight feet wide, about 12 feet long and fenced it off. And then he put chicken wire over the top and then he made a little gate for himself to go in and out. And he would go in and pick his tomatoes and do the weeding and all that kind of good stuff. And the squirrels could never, ever get inside. So that does work really, really well. Um, and you can even move it around if you make it just a temporary um, type fence. So it's not too difficult just to put up some two by four posts and then just attach fencing and chicken wire to it. So, um, the other thing we've talked about in the past is hunting. Again, that doesn't work too well in the city where there's regulations about using guns or pellet guns or whatever you, you want to do. And then, of course, the relocating after the trapping, uh, that can get to be a problem. They do say squirrels will um, return to an area if you don't take them far enough away. So you hear typically they'll tell you something like five miles. So it's a significant amount, so they don't come back. But the problem is then squirrels will come from the neighbors. So that's why um, the fencing seems to work really good if you put the cage over the top. And really that'll protect your tomatoes, which are the most primary target for squirrels they're likely to get. So. Other similar animals would be chipmunks and ground squirrels. Um, on the right, you'll see the Eastern chipmunk of course, they're both very cute uh, little animals. Um, we don't see the eastern chipmunk as much as we see this 13-lined uh, ground squirrel, um, fairly common. And um, you know, they like to burrow, have little burrows in garden areas, and they'll come up and they'll come around and they'll eat seeds out of, off of plants. They'll eat seeds that you plant. Um, and of course, they have their burrows going through your garden, so it can be a problem. Um, what some people do is put out poison for them, like around their burrows. Um, they, some people do live trapping. I actually had one situation where they were bad and we ended up just doing the flooding method. That's where I first heard about it from an older gardener who knew about this stuff and just said, stick the garden hose down there, turn it on. And see, they usually have multiple entrances to their burrow. So after I did that, I was flooding it. And so then after flooding it for a couple minutes, the you know ground squirrels decided to exit and they came up out of the other exits and they just started popping up and then they ran away. And then I think we did it again a week later and any that would try to come back realized this is not a good place to live. It keeps flooding here. 
we're going to go move somewhere else. So it seems to work fairly well. Raccoons. Raccoons are another thing which many, many years ago we didn't see as much of, but now they're pretty common in neighborhoods. Um, they like to get into people's trash cans. Even sometimes they'll go into people's garages if there's trash that they can get into food. And they do love, you know, vegetables, um, fruit, and uh, things like that. They're pretty much mostly vegetarian, although there is a strange phenomenon that they do um, for people who have chickens. You may or may not be aware of this, but they do like to kill chickens. And it's not so much that they like to eat them, but they like to kill them and they'll bite their heads off. Um, it's just very strange. I had that happen to me many years ago when we lived in the country near Boonville and I had some really nice chickens and raccoons just broke in and just killed all the chickens. So um, anyhow, their favorite foods are definitely sweet corn and fruit. Um, so um, if you have a sweet corn patch and there are raccoons nearby, they will smell that and they will find it. So you just need to be prepared for that. Um, sometimes people will put up electric fencing around that or just cage off their, their sweet corn or they'll put out the live traps to try and catch the raccoons. The other thing that they do love is fruit. Um, I went out and I had an apple tree, went out in the late evening and there were three fat little raccoons way up in my apple tree. And, um, you know, two of them I kind of chased down, but the third one just stayed up there. I guess waited until later when I had gone to bed and then came down, but they were eating my apples. And so the other thing is, as because they're kind of fat and heavy, as they walk out towards the end of the branch, they will break off the branches of the fruit trees and they fall to the ground and then they'll eat the fruit off of that. So they're just kind of troublesome that way. And again, there aren't very many natural predators, um, the coyotes and things like that aren't around so much. They are definitely nocturnal, so you are most likely not going to see raccoons um, unless it's late evening um, or if you go out at night, it's, it's a chance you could see them then with a flashlight if you have um, like a sweet corn patch. Um, if you do see a raccoon during the day, they say you should be cautious, careful. It could be rabid because you just don't walk around during the day. Um, but live trapping works pretty well. Of course, then involves relocating and all that kind of stuff. But um, it can be done. We did it here at our children's garden, and we got rid of most of them. And then we didn't have any raccoons for three or four years after that. And then after that, it wasn't as bad either. Another difficult pest, animal pest, would be the groundhog. Um, sometimes they're called woodchucks, but essentially the same thing. If you're not familiar with it, it looks kind of like what you think a beaver would look like, only they don't have the big flat tail. So here you can see a picture of one that's chomping down on something on the left here, see what they look like. And they do like to stand up like that and they'll stand up because their vision isn't very good and then they'll look to see what's going on and then they'll get back on all fours and crawl around. Um, they can go over a fence. They're not as good at it as raccoons are, but they can do it. Um, so they'll crawl over just a short little fence like that. Um, favorite foods, they do love sweet potato greens, but they also love fruit, especially cantaloupe. You have a ripe cantaloupe in your garden. It's just an invitation for uh, groundhogs to come. They are a burrowing animal. They'll dig big tunnels, burrows, uh, like under a shed or under a wood pile or whatever. Um, so that could be a problem. Um, but anyhow, they are definitely a problem. So the live trapping works pretty well. Um, of course, relocating. Uh, but also, you can try flooding. You know, uh, dogs are pretty good at chasing them away if you have a, a very active dog in your backyard. So. All right, mice and rats. Not very pleasant to think about, um, but you know we sometimes get them in our houses. There are parts of the city that do have more rats than others, um, so definitely can be a problem. Um, 
I usually don't think of mice as much of a problem. They aren't really that big of a problem, um, but they, they do chew on things if they're present a lot. Um, but rats can do a lot of damage. Um, here on the left, you'll see some sweet potatoes. I often get this question. People say something was eating my sweet potatoes. And of course the sweet potatoes are underground. So whatever that means is something that was digging underground and found them. And most typically that would be rats, um, especially if they're taking big chunks, like what you see in the pictures there out of. That's not just like some small mouse or a bowl. That would be rats. So as far as controlling rats, um, of course, you can use traps. And often the traps, I mean, the ones that I would be using would be the ones that just kill them, just like the, the mouse traps you put in your house, you know, if you're trying to catch mice that are causing problems. Um, they have larger ones that are for rats. Just have to be careful when you set them so you don't snap your fingers. Um, there's also poison baits that you can put out. Um, so if you do that, though, you want to use the kind that has a little bait station that so it's only only the rat or the mice can get into it. It's not like something where other animals can come along, like pets and things, and get into it, or children, et cetera. So you just have to be careful how you put it out. Um, another big factor, though, for particularly for a rat, but also mice, is um, sanitation. So if you leave stuff around, you know, people, you know, have a compost bin, you'll throw your rotted tomatoes down there. Sometimes people throw out their eggshells and things like that, um, vegetable scraps. If you have rats nearby, this kind of a compost bin will attract them. Uh, here you can see in this picture, there's actually a, a rat burrow down here in the lower left hand side. Um, so obviously, the rats think this compost pile is a great place to come and get food. Um, so what you can do is bury the stuff when you put it out, and that will help keep them out, um, or also just not make it quite as inviting. Uh, but sometimes what you have to do is maybe not put those things in uh, your regular compost pile, maybe get a compost drum, something that can be sealed up and then turned. So there's just different things you might have to do if you're going to keep out um, rats from a compost pile. All right, so in addition to rats and mice, there are little creatures called voles. And just the name is kind of confusing. Sometimes people think it's somehow a relative of a mole. Uh, it's really more relative to mice and rats. Um, they're kind of cute. Um, they're bigger than a mouse, smaller than a rat, and a little bit stockier. They just look furry or almost like a little guinea pig or something, um, or a hamster. Um, they do do damage to perennial plants, like the roots and also especially to vegetable root crops. So things like turnips, radishes, carrots, et cetera. And they do a lot of tunneling, they damage lawns. If you look in this picture here in the garden, you can see what it kind of looks like. So there's all these different holes, all these little tunnels that are kind of raised up and they just, you know, will tear up the ground and have all these tunnels. So um, obviously you can trap them, you can put out poison, you can do flooding, you can do repellents. My favorite would probably be the flooding. If you water that area enough, they are not going to want to stay there because it will cave in their tunnels. It'll make it a mess. Um, it just will not be a good thing for them to live there. So the flooding to me seems like one of the easiest ones, although there is a new repellent out um, here on our next slide, and that would be um, castor oil. They have discovered they do not like the smell or taste of castor oil. So you can actually just get castor oil and uh, you know put it in sprinkling cans, sprinkle it around if there is a bowl infested area that you have. But you can also buy commercial castor oil repellents um, that they make, you know, to a special formulation. Look on the internet, you can try those. Here you can see some damage. Uh, in the upper right-hand picture is some beets. You can see how they were chopping on those beets, which were on the ground. And, Below is some sweet potato. Again, not quite as big a damage as like a rat, um, but still nonetheless kind of damaging to your sweet potato. All right, moles, which are not related to bowls. Um, 
do not eat plants. So if you have moles in your backyard, and usually it's in your yard, although they can come into your garden too, um, they don't eat plants. And so you don't need to worry about them from the standpoint of it's not like they're going to eat up all your, your carrots or your beets or turnips and things like that. Um, but their burrows, their tunnels, are just a pain in your yard or your garden. Um, just raises up and you'll see, um, typically the sign that you have a mole is where you just see this little tiny hill of, of dirt that's all nicely granulated. And um, that's because from the burrowing and that's, they came up and they stuck their head up, kind of like in this picture here. Sometimes they surface at, and of course they're at night also. They'll come to the surface like that and then they'll go back down. Um, and so if you see that, that's a sign that you have mold. But then in between these, you'll see like kind of a raised ridge that's from the tunnel. So if you look at this picture in the right hand lower corner, you can see what the tunnel thing looks like. So there are traps, and generally they are a kill trap. And it's a spring operated type thing that you um, set and you step on it with your foot and that sets it. And then the problem is then you have to get rid of the dead mold afterwards. So that is um, a problem some people don't like having to do things like that. There are some poisons that you can put out too. Again, you just have to be careful so that other animals don't access those. There are some things that don't seem to work at all. Um, one of the most funny is there were these uh, plastic sunflower sort of little uh, windmill type things that were going around. And uh, it looks like a little plastic sunflower on a stake. And it, when the wind blew, it would go around in a circle, kind of like a pinwheel. And the, the rumor going around was that that would make vibrations underground and that the moles would not want to live there. But it has absolutely no effect on them whatsoever. Um, there are some mole repellents, but again, most likely, if you repel them from your yard, they're just going to go next door to your neighbor's yard, which may or may not be a problem for you. Birds um, can be a garden pest. They can also be garden beneficial. There's lots of birds that eat lots of insects. Um, some that eat mosquitoes and all kinds of um, beetles and things that might be um, causing problems for you. So birds, some birds are definitely good. Other ones um, don't eat insects so much, but like to eat fruit. Um, particularly things like blackberries are big, big attractive crop for for birds, I can almost guarantee you that if you have blackberry plants, you will have birds show up at some point. Here in our children's garden, here at Kansas City Community Gardens, we had planted some blackberries. And the second year, they were big. And you know they have their fruit in the second year. And they, I could tell they were going to be loaded with fruit. And the fruit was just starting to ripen. And I saw a couple of blackbirds, well, not blackbirds, a couple of birds out there eating the blackberries. And I thought, oh gosh, I hope they don't do too much. And then I came out like three or four days later and every single blackberry was gone. So it's like other birds heard about it and then came back and they just finished off all those blackberries. So you can put out netting, um, bird netting, and I would just throw it over the top and that will help. Um, the thing is you have to pin it down and fasten it really good to the ground so that there's no way for birds to kind of get underneath or wherever you join the two ends together um, because it's a really pain uh, for you and for the bird if they get caught in that netting and they can't get out. Sometimes that will happen if you have open. So you just got to be careful about that. Birds will also, besides eating fruit, um, they'll sometimes uh, damage young vegetable transplants like a tomato plant will come and they'll snip off a bunch of it, uh, like taking it for nesting material. So that can be a problem also. But bird netting <laughs> um, does work fairly well. And then there's snakes. Um, people have uh, strong feelings about snakes in many cases. Um, some people are terrified of snakes. And I will admit that snakes can be alarming. Um, I don't fear them like I used to as a child. Um, and I've you know, learned that most snakes are, are not poisonous. 
it is a good idea to learn what a poisonous snake looks like. Um, like here in Missouri, we have copperheads. Less common would be rattlesnakes. To we'll learn what those snakes look like, they have the flat, triangular shaped head, very different from other snakes like a black snake or a garter snake. In fact, in this picture here, the one in the lower left hand corner, that is a garter snake, which sometimes people call a garden snake, even though it's garter, G A R T E R. Um, and they are often People think they're going to be poisonous or something like that, and they will kill the snake. Same thing with black snakes. They get larger. Um, they get pretty good size. They can be kind of alarming. People get worried about them and will kill them. Unfortunately, snakes are beneficial, at least unfortunately, if you kill them. But uh, generally, I considered snakes a positive thing in the yard, other than the fact they can be scary, especially for some people and children. Um, but it's good to cultivate a healthy respect for snakes and realize that they are important parts of the ecosystem as far as they um, control rodents and other, other creatures. Again, they're, they're scary. They'll surprise you if you're just all of a sudden weeding along in your garden and you encounter a snake. And obviously, until you know if it's not poisonous, you just need to be cautious. But even a, a non-poisonous snake like this black snake here, if you try to pick it up, it will bite you. Uh, it just won't have poison. Um, so there's a couple things you can do to control snakes. Uh, the, the, the best thing would be to keep down your grass, mow your grass very short all around your garden. Don't have tall grass or tall weeds. Keep the weeds out of the garden um, so you'll be much less likely to have snakes if you don't have tall grass and weeds around your garden. So, but there also is, excuse me, snake repellent. Um, and you'll see this at the store here in the middle, uh, Dr. T's Snake Away. And believe it or not, this is a product that sounds like kind of a, uh, you know, I don't know, kind of a gimmick thing. That, it wouldn't actually work, but it actually does work and it is effective and will help people um, keep snakes away from their garden. I knew of a lady for years and years and years, she'd call me every year and she'd tell me she was afraid that she might have snakes in her garden. It's possible she did, um, but eventually I told her about the snake repellent and she tried that and she said it worked and she hadn't seen any more snakes in her garden and took away her fear of going out into her garden. So that was a very useful thing. And then there's cats and dogs. We talked about them as possibly being beneficial as animal control to maybe chase away squirrels, rabbits, um, different things like that, um, raccoons. Um, but they can also be a pest in the garden because dogs often, you know, if they're allowed to run loose, they tear up a garden, dig up, they'll start digging, they'll run through, they'll Temple plants, all kinds of things like that. And of course, cats, you know, they can leave behind their um, droppings, you know, uh, feces, and so that's not good in your garden. Um, so it, it can be problems. Uh, I would say dogs are probably a bigger problem in the sense that they will tear up a garden. And I've had people say, well, I have to fence off my garden or fence off my dog, um, or it's, like, it's not going to work. You have to do one or the other. So um, they can be a problem. So, and then our last little creature is, is smaller, and you also might think it's more of an insect thing, but it's actually uh, not a true insect. Slugs and snails are actually part of the group of animals called mollusks. So, think of things like uh, oysters, clams, um, that kind of stuff, seafood animals. Um, so, they are, um, if, you, if you're not familiar with slugs, slug looks like a snail that doesn't have a shell. So here you have a snail that has a shell on its back that it goes into, um, whereas slugs are just out on their own all the time. And that's typically more of what I would see in the garden. The damage almost always happens at night. Sometimes somebody will tell me that something ate their um, lettuce and 
you know, they're just trying to figure out what it was. Um, and they'll say, it wasn't a rabbit. I know it wasn't a rabbit. I don't have deer. Uh, it just happened overnight. And typically that would be slugs, um, especially in the cool, moist spring. Um, you know, and if you have mulch, I do like to mulch my plants, but I used to try to wait till we get a little bit warmer weather in early May, less likely to have slugs and snails hiding in the mulch. So, um, but they are just eating machines. They'll eat big holes in their leaves. They also will eat small fruits, especially sometimes if they're damaged. Like here in this lower right-hand picture, you see like a cherry tomato. That might have been damaged like by a, a bird or something. And then the slug comes along and finds it and it's able to get in there. And eat it. So, um, or, if, or if it's just rotten or something, rotten tomato, slugs will climb on that. They do like to get in lettuce, um, lettuce plants. So like when I'm opening up a head of lettuce and then peeling off the outside leaves, I'm always kind of keeping an eye out for slugs. Um, same thing is true of heads of cabbage. You take away the outer wrapper leaves and sometimes inside you'll find a slug. So you just have to be careful to remove that part of the plant. So there's lots of different kinds of baits for slugs and some of them are pretty toxic and I would not want to leave them out. So really the best one is this product called Sluggo. Um, it's an iron phosphate. An iron phosphate is not a super toxic thing if some other animal ate it, but um, also they're just not likely to eat it. <coughs> so that works pretty well. And it's really the answer if you have slugs or snails eating your vegetable pots. So that is all our animals. Um, so now typically when I do this workshop live, I get lots and lots and lots of questions. So um, Rob, if you can um, help me with that, I'll check my email. Okay, <clears throat> uh, go ahead and unshare your screen and I'm gonna share my screen yeah. about, let's see here. Okay, can everybody, can you see that Ben? Uh, my screen? Sorry, yes. You can't see it? Uh, yes, the email. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, here I'm sending the email. So you should have it. There's about four questions, it looks like. Okay. And uh, so I just wanted to show everybody um, if you want to see a recording of this workshop, you can go to our website, kccg.org. And under the resources here, this tab, you scroll down to how to videos. And then right here is our virtual workshops here. And this has been all of our two, 2021 workshops, all the virtual workshops that Ben has done this year. Let it load. It's all YouTube. And so um, you scroll down, it'll be near the bottom. We also have some cooking workshops. Uh, so there you have it. And so, Ben, did you get my email? Um, so how do I get to that from if you're sharing screen? Oh, let me... Well, you should be able to see it just in your email. I don't know if you need to share your screen, but I can go, I can unshare. Okay, wait a second. Yeah, hang on. Because all I'm seeing right now is your screen. Um, okay, okay I, I help. stopped sharing, so you should be yeah, good. To that'll go. help me. Yeah. Okay, now I can see the questions. Um, and now I'm trying to get back to the Zoom, hang on. Okay, well, I'll just go ahead and answer the questions. Um, trying to move this out of the way. Well, I don't remember having this problem. Hold on just a second. Okay, hang on one second. Okay, 
So first question was the idea of caging sounds interesting, but how would you do that with individual containers? And that is that would be difficult. Um, typically, if you're having a, a a vegetable plant in a container, I would be doing it in a large container. And I literally would just take a roll of chicken wire or the roll fencing, the two by four inch space fencing that you get like at Home Depot. And uh, because it comes in a roll, it wants to stay kind of in a circle anyhow, and just cut out a little circle and literally just put that in the container. Uh, and that would help. And if you don't fasten it down deep, you can literally just lift that container off um, so that you can get in if you need to harvest something. But it, it definitely is not easy. So um, I guess I would wait to see if I actually was having a problem first before I resorted to putting cages around my container. Because you might have certain crops that they don't seem to bother at all. Um, other crops they might bother, or you just may not have any pests right where you're at. So, um, but it would not be easy, but it could be done. Okay. The next question was, can you eat sweet potatoes if they've had damage from the critters? And the answer is yes. I would just cut off the parts that had been chomped on, just like I would with a, an apple or something. If like a bug got in there, I'll just cut off the bad part and get rid of it and then save the good part that hasn't been chewed on or whatever. And it's fine to use that, especially if something like sweet potato, you're going to be cooking it. So there really isn't uh, any kind of danger from that. Um, what kind of gauge or strength of mesh fencing fabric is effective for deterring squirrels? So they can't tear it up and get into the tomato plants. Um, that is a good question. Um, I would have to look at it, but basically the, what they call, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you'll see some garden fencing and it has two inches by four inch spacing on the opening between the wires. And that gauge there, I'm not sure what gauge it is, uh, but that appears to be plenty strong enough for squirrels that they are not going to tear it up and get in there. Um, but I also, like my friend who was doing it, he did the, the two by four fencing around the outside and then he put chicken wire over the top. And that just seemed to work fine. He just had to make sure that he fastened the chicken wire, you know, with wire to the fencing so that there were no gaps anywhere. Um, but it, it does seem like it's it worked really well. And then the last question I saw here was how does the mesh fabric uh, fencing or netting affect the amount of sunlight that a plant needs? And I would say that's very negligible. Um, just because most, you know, like on that, most of the area is open. It doesn't really make much shade. So it doesn't really seem to be a factor. The other thing is like with the blackberry plants, um, you're really putting that down uh, just kind of when the blackberries are in season, um, you know, ripening at the very end. So it's not like it's out there all season. So, um, but even in any case, it still doesn't really cut down on the sunlight very much. There's, a whole lot of other things that would shade it more than that. Um, so it's not a problem. So I don't know if there's any additional questions coming in, Rod. Yeah, I have one more here. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it says here, uh, if rabbits are not into lettuce, what else is? He had a pretty high fence uh, that rabbits weren't able to pop over. So what else would be eating it? Okay, so that quite likely could be deer. Um, if we had deer nearby, but also that could be the groundhog. Um, um, so different things like that, yeah. And I'm not saying rabbits wouldn't ever eat lettuce, they could, but typically they kind of just leave it alone. I was really surprised, I was really expecting rabbits. Um, and you know, maybe there's different kinds of lettuce that they do like, so there, there's always that possibility, but in general, Rabbits have not been the culprit for lettuce. It's been deer or possibly groundhogs. Would would squirrels be eating lettuce? I know squirrels don't um, eat lettuce, but you know they could. Um, I would think that they would be eating very much. They might just eat an occasional leaf, but yeah. you know if you had big bites, 
The other thing is if you have young lettuce transplants and they are really chomped on, often that would be slugs um, rather than a larger animal. So um, if they will just, you know, if it's a full size head of lettuce, no, it's not going to disappear on you. But um, if you put out your lettuce transplants and they're just nibbled down to nubs the first week or two, very likely that could be slugs. Okay. All right, that's all I have. So um, thanks for joining us, everybody. And like I said, if you want to check out this uh, recording, you can go to our website under the resources and how to videos. So um, check it out. I'll try to have that up by Monday. Thank you, everybody.